Dear subscribers, as you know, we shared many information for you, and we are studying very hard to find current news for you. However, I cannot use this channel for future. Please follow our new channel called As Daily News Report and watch our video to support us. Link in description. Also, you can reach the video we shared on Daily News Report by clicking on the top right button. We highly recommend watching, subscribing and sharing. We will continue to share some news on this channel where we take precautions against some situations for future. Thank you for supporting us. I mean, can you just give us a little rundown of what's going on here with everything that's happening in China? It has been a crazy month, hasn't it? Yeah, um, it really has. At the, I guess at the at the foundation of all of that is the peg that the Chinese have of the yuan to the dollar. So as the dollar has been strengthening and rallying versus other fiat currencies, it has been, by extension, strengthening and rallying the yuan, which is something the Chinese did not want. They'd rather keep their their currency down uh, in in their eyes, making it more competitive. And so therefore, as the dollar was rallying, and it has been kind of off and on for the last year or two. That's been putting this pressure on the Chinese. They finally acted to devalue and lower that peg, um, what, a month ago? And they did it a few times in succession. And then what ha happened is there began to be kind of a run of selling against it. And they drove that on lower than what the People's Bank of China wanted it to be. And so all of a sudden, they needed to drive it back up. And uh, what we have now is proof that in order to pull that off, they liquidated something like $90 billion of their U.S. Treasury foreign currency reserves. And in doing so, took those dollars, that, that $91 billion, and, and bought themselves a bunch of their own currency to drive it back up. So, so it's what started as them wanting to uh, devalue and uh, lower the value of the yuan. It got away from them, then all of a sudden they had to drive it back up. It was really a convoluted process, and it has now implications for what the Fed might do uh, coming up here later this week at the conclusion of this FOMC meeting on Thursday. Because it, I guess the traditional school of thought would be if the Fed were to raise the Fed funds rate, even you know, even if it's only 15 basis point or 25 basis points, that that would uh, strengthen the dollar even more, which by extension would strengthen the yuan which could very well put the Chinese right back into the same position they were a month ago and could lead us right back down the same path. So there's a lot of complex arithmetic in behind what might happen with the FOMC later this week. And uh, that the implications for China and uh, all emerging markets and their currencies and the currency wars are, are all very huge and significant. And it'll be very interesting to see how this all plays out in the days ahead. Now, you mentioned the Fed raising the interest rates. I mean, what effect do you think it will have here in the United States if they do this? Well, here's the funny thing, Dave. Mm -hmm. uh, we're traditionally, and anybody that is, you don't even have to be probably a, a financial planner or anything to, to recall this kind of uh, interest rates are bad for stocks. I mean, that's kind of the, uh, the, the mantra, the dogma of uh, financial planning or stockbrokers or whomever, because uh, the idea being that that makes bonds more attractive and because then they pay a higher yield or something like that. And so asset allocation takes place away from stocks into bonds. You know, that that's kind of the traditional line of thinking. Um, I would suggest to you, though, that all of the traditional stuff is now out the window. We really don't have functioning uh, equity uh, currency commodity markets anymore, at least not in the sense that we did 10, 20 years ago. Everything is driven by a computer now. 75, 80% of the volume of, of uh, New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ stocks is all high frequency trading computers, just simply swapping them back to, to back and forth amongst each other at the speed of light, trying to clip each other for fractions of a penny. And recognizing that uh, central banks like the Fed or the Bank of Japan or the Swiss National Bank can impact whether stocks 
in general go up or down by affecting some of the input factors that go into these high high frequency trading machine algorithms okay mm -hmm. so if you can as a central bank or anybody that attempt that wants to and has the scale to pull it off anybody that wants to move the market one way or the other if you can just move uh, in an index like the vix the volatility index or if you can move uh, even more importantly a single currency pair like the US dollar versus a Japanese yen then that influences these high frequency trading machines to buy or sell whichever direction you want them to go okay so i mean i'm going to let me expand that thought even rising interest rates should be bad for the stock market that's a traditional thing i would suggest to you that if the fed actually does raise rates on thursday stocks will go up now i don't know if they will raise rates or not but if they do it's very likely that stocks will rally and it will surprise everybody and the reason for that is by raising the short term fed funds rate it should rally the dollar again making the dollar more competitive because you've got a higher and people want dollars to invest here in the short term because the in, there's actually an interest rate above zero if the dollar's rallying and specifically rallying against the japanese yen that is again that's the cue that these machines take to buy stocks Anybody that can, anybody listening to us can go to, you know, a site like investing.com or barchart.com or any place where you can get free charts. If you pull up a chart of that currency pair, the yen and the dollar together, the, the symbol is the USDJPY. If you pull that up and then you overlay the S&P 500 or the mini ES S&P futures over that chart, you will see that they move in a direct clear obvious one-to-one -one correlation and again that's because these markets are all driven by these computers so wrapping this all, all back together in one big bow this is where things have gotten so bizarre these days if the fed raises rates the dollar will likely rally versus the yen and if the dollar rallies versus the yen these hft machines are going to buy stocks and so that's where it all stands on your head rising rates at least in the very short term will cause the stock market to go up so <laughs> how's that for something unusual? So they'll see the stock market going. I mean, this is completely manipulated. This is not a free market whatsoever. Right. No, um, it's not. It's an illusion of the yeah. market. I mean, we'll see the stock market, and that's great for you know the elite and and the very top notch people, and some other people who are saying, "Oh, look, everything's better now." Mm -hmm. But what happens to everything else, like real estate, for instance? Um, because, you know, they're telling us that real estate's in a recovery. If, you know, interest rates go up, you know, this is going to have an effect on, you know, loans, mortgages, you know, automobile loans, things like that. Isn't, isn't this going to have, uh, a, a, an effect here in the country where things are going to start to fall apart in other areas? I mean, we I saw agree. this back in 2007, 2008. Um, Absolutely. Uh, Sorry. You know, Dave, uh, uh, you had mentioned to me earlier the idea you, you had spoken with Rob Kirby. I'm sure Rob Kirby mentioned uh, all of the interest rate derivatives that are out there mm -hmm. that are based off of zero percent. I mean, the, by raising interest rates, the, I mean, even just the, the slightest bit, the the effect could be substantial and, and dire. And, and getting back to what we said earlier, again, if if they raise even if it's 15 basis points, 25 basis points, if the dollar does rally from there, it, it, we're going to be right back to where we were four weeks ago with China. And China is going to be seeing the yuan go back up, which is what they didn't want, want to do. And then they're going to be devaluing. And then that's going to all, all the other uh, it, besides all the other consequences that exact, we saw exactly happen last month. Uh, that's going to make other emerging markets want to devalue their currency and then an extension of these currency wars. No, I hear you. It, it is, if the Fed were to raise rates, I mean, the, the impact is, uh, got, you know, it's like a war, you know, the unintended consequences, you know, that you can never predict. I mean, right. as these dominoes start to fall into each other, I, it'll be very interesting to see where we are a week, two, three weeks from now. But also at the same time, I mean, if the Fed does not, Reasons. And they're going to be exposed or at least begin to be exposed, even in the mainstream media, as the kind of the liars and the spinners that they are. You know, we've heard for 
six years now about the green shoots, you know, and the recovery and the, every time the FOMC would meet, they'd put out a statement that would say, well, we expect rates to be low for an exceptional period of time, but by middle of 2013, we're going to start raising, you know, and then it was, well, by the beginning of 2014, we expect to start raising, you know, and it, <laughs> they've been playing this game for so long now that finally their bluff is being called. And so if they don't do anything, all of a sudden they and the other central banks are exposed for, you know, the, the bluffers and the spinners that they are. And so they begin to lose whatever credibility they have left, even in the eyes of the kind of mainstream media and the mainstream analysts. And so they're really getting put into a box. Yeah. And it was very, like I said, it's very, very interesting to see what they do and how they try to manage their way out of that box come Thursday. And one other point I have to say is when you say the, uh, if they raise the interest rates, the, the stock market's going to go up and the dollar is going to rally and then they're going to devalue the yuan again. Um, and then they're most likely going to have to sell more treasuries at that point. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we just have this reoccurring cycle here. Uh, and it doesn't, no matter which scenario you look at, it, it doesn't look good. Yeah. You know, and it, it was, I guess the kind of the general theme or the, what people always used to talk about, about the Chinese and their, well, they there are probably under a trillion dollars in treasuries now after this latest dump because it was about 10%, I think, of what they had or a little under than that. And and folks always said, oh, you don't have to worry about that because you don't have to worry about them selling because they can't uh, because it would disrupt the market so much if they did, you know, and, and it would by selling all these bonds that would put pressure on bond prices, which would make interest rates spike up and it would devalue whatever bonds they have left and all these kind of mainstream views out there as to why the Chinese would never dream of liquidating their uh, their foreign currency reserves that are in treasuries. But heck, they just did, you know, almost 10 percent in a month. And they've been not adding and slowly liquidating really for a year. It was just this big chunk in, in August that that kind of caught everybody by surprise. Well, look how they did it. I mean, they did that. And yet there really was no appreciable change in in 10 year or 30 year interest rates. I mean, they wiggled up and down a little bit, but they were able to do that into market conditions that actually absorbed that, that 91 billion dollars of bonds that they sold. Now, I don't know who the buyers were, whether it was just the traditional buyers, you know, hedge funds and and banks and stuff like that, or if it was other central banks, uh, Western central banks that were buying them, you know, in need of collateral and everything else. But the at the end of the day, what probably matters most is that they were able to sell $91 billion worth of treasuries in just two weeks and really didn't move the needle. And so, you know, you begin to kind of think geopolitically and you think, well, maybe that was part of their plan in the first place. I don't know. Uh, it's impossible to say. But it, it is a uh, very interesting theater that we're all getting to watch now here in the last you know couple of months of 2015. And anybody that tells you that they know exactly how it's going to play out, and you know, and it's and, and you can make book on it, is uh, is obviously trying to sell you something. There are too many variables involved, and you ju you just can't. It's just totally unpredictable as to how this is all going to play out in the months ahead. It's just. It, what you can be sure of is there's going to be a lot of volatility um, in all global markets, upward and downward, and it'll be very interesting to watch. Yeah, we're seeing that now. I mean, let me ask you about this debt. I mean, we know the debt has doubled since 2008, and we see the world debt is just astronomical right now. Mm -hmm. uh, can this in any way be sustained? And if interest, interest rates do go up, how does it affect the debt? Well, at, that, at the end of the day, that's why interest rates can't go up. And it's part of the reason why they're down as low as they are. I mean, the, as you mentioned, the, the total debt of the U.S., though it's been held sideways now for months because of the <laughs> kind of the scam of the debt ceiling. Um, but that's a whole other story. Um, what is it, $18 trillion or something yeah. like that? Um, the line item, though, in the the federal budget, because, you know, we're still running a deficit and depends on who you let do the counting and how they do it. Uh, it tells you, what do they say now? It's $500 billion or $450 billion a year. What do you mean? It's all, you know, kind of a scam and moving numbers around anyway. But the line item of 
interest on the federal debt of the U.S. is about $350 billion a year. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go back and look four or five years ago, it was $350 billion a year. But we know that the total debt has grown by, you know, four or five trillion dollars since uh, 2009. So wait a second. How could that be if the total amount of debt has has grown by five trillion, but the interest that we're paying every year is roughly the same? Well, the reason they've been able to do that is that in this period of just like everybody else with their mortgage, you know, with interest rates this low, you refinance, you know, from an 8% mortgage to a 4% mortgage, right? Mm -hmm. That's basically what the federal, uh, uh, what the Treasury Department has done is they've moved all of that debt into an average maturity of about four years, four and a half years. And by doing so, have brought the interest rate, just the total overall interest rate on that debt down to these extreme levels. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's how the federal, the interest, that line item of the budget, that's $350 billion a year in interest, that's how it's been able to maintain and be low. Okay, so now what would happen if all of a sudden interest rates were to normalize, as they like to say on CNBC and Bloomberg? If all of a sudden the 10-year treasury went from 2% to 4% to 6% over the next few years? Well, as that accumulated debt all comes due because they've shortened the maturities, the interest rate on that debt goes up. From 3% to 4% to 5% to 6%. And that line item in the budget goes up from $350 billion to $700 billion to $900 billion. And your de deficit that they're all championing now is down to $450 billion a year. Well, all of a sudden, just that one line item is $900 billion. <laughs> and so the deficit just explodes. And that's where it all becomes, and the, the, the word you use, unsustainable. It's this exponential spiral. If you, you know, think of a, a line on a chart that just goes parabolic at the end, going straight up. It's what your, you know, your grandmother or my grandmother always used to tell me. You know, at least pay the interest on your credit card so that you know the interest doesn't just take off, you know, and grow exponentially on you. And that's where we are, though. Now that's where I mean, they put it off as long as they can, and. In the end, that's why interest rates cannot be allowed to go back up. Oh, they can jigger the Fed funds rate 25 basis points, I, I suppose, if they think that's what they need to do for their member banks come Thursday. Mm -hmm. But this idea that somehow, you know, we're going back to a, a what used to be a normal interest rate curve, you know, of 2% on the short end and 6% on the long end, that's just, it's just not going to happen. It's just it, because if it did, the entire, you know, debt Ponzi just completely unravels. And so that's kind of a, a big picture look at how, uh, how, how it, it won't work. I mean, how they can't allow it to go that way. But, you know, again, that's not going to stop them from raising 25 basis points on Thursday for appearances sake. So we yeah. shall see. Yeah, we'll see what happens. plays out. We'll see on Thursday what they do here. Now, Robert Schiller was out there, and he's saying that the stock market is starting to look like a bubble. Um, I mean, I see bubbles all over the place. I don't know if you do see it. If you sure. see it also, I mean, I see it in housing, auto, treasuries, um, of course, the stock market, uh, and derivatives. And uh, I mean, do you think these bubbles can get any bigger? That's, that's the $64,000 question, isn't it? That's why I'm asking uh, you. <laughs> yeah. How, how far can they go before, you know, they just, they just collapse, you know, and, and wall street securitizes all these bubbles. You know, I mean, we learned nothing from 2007 and 2008. You mentioned uh, auto sales, you know, and, and the, the subprime auto sales and this idea, I, I, all you have to do is what I, I saw an ad on my local news, I don't know, a couple of nights ago. The 10 o'clock news, you know, bring in your car, even if you're underwater, we'll refinance your car and get you a new car. And and so you can go into your local auto dealer now, owing $20,000 on a $10,000 car, trade it in. They'll take the $10,000 you owe and just tack it on to your new $30,000 car loan. So now you own $40,000 on a $20,000 car, you know, that depreciates as soon as you drive it off the lot. And that just ain't going to work. But yet, 
then what happens? They these loans all get bundled together in the same CDOs that Wall Street blew everything up with in 2007 and 8. I, and it's just mind-boggling that that again we put ourselves into this exact same position. Whether it's that type of bubble, whether it's the student loans, um, whether it's the high yield debt, you know, and all of the high yield debt that some of these energy companies up in North Dakota were cranking out over the last couple of years. I mean, all of these things are could be the potential, you know, uh, uh, first domino, you know, the the first thing, the daisy chain that could really start. Uh, running things down again. It's really, it almost seems as if it's a matter of time. We've been able, the Fed has been able to, or somebody's been able to keep the stock market afloat for the last uh, year or so. We've seen, boy, again, we mentioned pulling up a chart. Anybody listening, pull up a, a chart of the S&P 500 just over the last 12 months. And I think the last count, I, I could easily draw 18 or 19 V-shaped reversals, I mean, where the market would come down, and then just when everything looked like, okay, here we go, boy, oh, oh, it would just spring right back higher. And a lot of that is due to this affecting how those high-frequency trading machines buy or sell, like we discussed earlier. Right. But there's been clearly a movement to try to keep it up. You know, that Bernanke and, and uh, Yellen as well are big believers in this idea of the wealth effect. Mm-hmm. That if your 401k is, you know, you get your statement, and you look at it's up versus what it was last month. And you feel pretty good enough about yourself that you go buy a new refrigerator, you know, and, and right. keep the economy going. And so, uh, so there, there is an incentive to, to try to continue to float the stock market as long as you can. But again, I, I, to me, with, with all the years I've been looking at this, you know, remembering of what it used to to be like you know in 1989 or in 1995 or whatever it, it's all an illusion there there's no you know it's not a market of stocks with people making rational decisions you know buying and selling off of the fundamentals of the individual companies you know and somebody buys 200 shares of coca-cola because they like their their international prospects for growth no i mean there's hardly any of that anymore again it's all these machines just swapping stocks back and forth guided into those positions by uh, a, a couple of factors and that's what we're left with uh, as a functioning stock market allegedly you know as as it's described and so whether that can hang in there how much longer that can hang in there is all what's up for question um again i i just don't want any part of it i'm very happy to own gold and silver <laughs> and just mean- patiently and stack it Let's talk about gold and silver. I mean, sure. I mean, I'm a buyer of gold and silver, and I continually see the price continually drop. And every time I see it drop, mm-hmm. I say, "Ooh, this is a good time to purchase." Yeah. And um, I mean, a lot of people are out there saying, "Oh, look, gold silver is down again. See, it's not really going anywhere. It's not something you should hold. You got to get rid of it because it's going to go lower." I mean, what is going on here with precious metals? Everybody listening has to um, recognize. That again, we're talking about a paper market and the illusion of an actual, you know, economically derived market price. The price, if you will, the dollar conversion price, the price at which you can take your dollars and buy yourself an ounce of gold or silver is determined still to this day by a large part by trading on COMEX in New York. It's a paper derivative market. It is. Uh, at a minimum, there are about a hundred uh, beneficial owners for every single ounce backing up that market, actual physical ounce. At present, it's more than two hundred. Now that you know that can be moved around. They can the banks that run the vaults can move gold here and there to create the the kind of an illusion of a physical connection. But for now. This price at which you can buy or sell physical metal is still determined by this paper derivative trading of uh, bank trading desks versus some of these high frequency trading computers and hedge funds. It, it's it's not connected to physical supply and demand. It's not connected to the amount of gold that is flowing into China. It's not connected to the amount of insatiable appetite of for gold and silver in places like India 
uh, for now, it's just simply derived by the whims of these trading funds and these high frequency trading computers. Again, I get back to the exact same point we we're making earlier. If you go back to 2012, about exactly this time three years ago, the Ben Bernank, as we call him, announced <laughs> what at the time appeared to be QE to infinity. Remember, it was going to be $40 billion a month of mortgage-backed securities and $45 billion a month of treasuries. It was going to be a trillion brand new dollars that they were going to buy. Previous QE programs had sent gold and silver bulls soaring higher. And even I thought, boy. Like three years ago, we were at eighteen hundred dollars. And I, thought, well, I mean, why wouldn't you think? Here we go again, right? I mean, right. this the previous QE had only been six hundred billion dollars, and now we're going to do a trillion. And you could pull up charts showing that as the U.S. debt grew and the debt ceiling grew, the gold price grew right along with it. I mean, there's no reason not to think that gold wouldn't just keep charging a new highs, but instead it went counterintuitively straight down, beginning three years ago. All right. Here's some more homework for everybody. Pull up that chart of the yen again and look what happened three years ago. Beginning in October of 2012, the yen began to go straight down. And the and gold, in almost a one-to-one -one correlation, paper gold went straight with it. <laughs> and that, as strange as it may seem, that is the key determinant of the paper price over the last three years, the value of the Japanese yen. What does that have to do with anything? That has no that has no basis and that doesn't have anything to do with fundamentals. That doesn't have anything to do with the physical demand coming out of China or India or the physical supply in London. The paper price has been derived by changes simply in the Japanese yen, or at least in large part. And that makes no sense. That's not an economically sustainable pricing structure. And so I guess then your, your follow-up question, Dave, would be, okay, well, what's going to break that? Correct. Uh, That's, when, that is my follow-up question, yes. <laughs> yeah. When would that end? Okay. There has to be, to have that paper derivative price have any legitimacy or significance, there has to be physical delivery made at that price. There must still be, right? I mean, there's there's still delivery taking place in the major center in London at that at that paper price, and as long as there is, then the paper price still has legitimacy. What we watch very closely is the divergence between the physical price and the paper price. We're beginning to see again now what's called a backwardation, which really should never happen between um, the spot price where the physical transactions take place being higher and sometimes significantly higher than that futures price in New York. That's a sign of shortage. There were other signs of physical shortage, like what we call the, the gold forward rates in London. were always an indication of whether there was immediate physical shortage in London. For 24 years, those gold forward rates were positive for all but seven days. Beginning last November, we're actually going back to June of 2013. All of a sudden, they were negative about half the time. Beginning last November, they were negative to historic levels. And then you know what happened? London stopped printing those rates so that we couldn't follow that as an indicator anymore. There are all sorts of anecdotal reports coming out of London. There was a guy just last week, the uh, CEO and founder of Russia's second largest uh, gold mining company, that said there is no gold left in London. There is no stock. They are simply existing off of flow, desperately trying to uh, fill the orders from the east with whatever's left of central bank gold or unallocated stored gold. And what is he, what is happening now is this kind of fractional reserve pricing system, bullion bank scheme, whatever you want to call it, is beginning to unravel. Like I said, think of it as, as uh, like a big game of musical chairs. You know, you played as a kid where there was, to begin with, there was one chair for, for everybody playing the game and the music stops and everybody sits on a chair and then you take a chair out and the music stops. And if you don't sit down fast enough, you know, there's not enough chairs for everybody. In New York, where the COMEX structure or the, uh, provides a price, at present, there's about 200 people walking around one chair. Now, they can try to add a few more chairs by moving some, some, you know, paper book entries and journal some gold around. But if those 200 people ever all try to sit down at once, the whole system will fail. 
Um, there just simply won't be gold left. Now, I don't, and, and silver too. The, 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 what would be foolish would be to try to say, and that's going to happen next Wednesday. <laughs> because because then, you know, it probably won't happen next Wednesday, you know, or on October the 12th or, you know, any date. All that we know for certain is that it will fail, that the, the import, the, the flow of gold from west to east continues, the demand is insatiable, and eventually it'll just be gone and gone for good. And at that point, the this paper pricing structure falls apart. And then we finally realize how much gold there's left and what an actual fair price is. I don't know what that price will be, but it ain't $1,100 an ounce. Yeah, so that's, I'm, that's where I'll leave it. I mean, I hear people, you know, saying, you know, thirty, forty thousand dollars if you're pricing it in dollars. I mean, that's what they're saying. That's where it would be around. Yeah, and I, I hear all different things. Yeah, but we know it's going to be a lot higher than eleven hundred. Right. You know, people. Um, I've there are ways that folks try to figure out what a fair price would be. Mm. And again, and it's not eleven hundred dollars. Just like it wasn't thirty five dollars back in nineteen seventy three. Right. Right. Uh, it went from 35 in 73 to 800 in 1980, you know, once the U S closed the gold window and the gold pool in London that was supplying physical metal to market, to try to hold the price at 35. Once that all fell apart, I mean, what is that? 20 times, 20 fold increase. Right. Okay. Uh, I have no idea what the price will be. Uh, some folks look at it and say, okay, well, you got to look at the money supply. You divide how much golds in Fort Knox into the M1 money supply, the M2 money supply, and that gives you, you know, $12,000 an ounce. Okay, maybe. What uh, The reason why I say I have no idea what the price will be is because I don't know how much gold there's left. I mean, that assumes there is 8,000 tons unencumbered, you know, held by the Fed or, you know, all that. I mean, that is, there is uh, fully allocated gold for everybody that they own it in London. You know, that assumes all the people that have gold that they held in, in the Swiss banking system that's been rehypothecated and leased out all these times over. That assumes it's all there. If we learn that there's no gold left, well, then if you have, you have zero supply of something, the, the value is almost infinite. I mean, it's really impossible to try to say what the value is. Um, I'm just suggesting that it's... <laughs> When the dust finally settles, when this this current system that's been in place for almost 31 years, pricing it through this paper structure on the COMEX, once it all finally breaks apart, and it will, then we're going to find out, at least have at least better idea of, of what the actual value is. And again, it's not $1,100 an ounce. So when this whole thing breaks apart, I mean, we're talking about everything just falling apart and they lo completely lose control of pretty much everything at that point. I mean, are we going to experience what we saw in 2008? I mean, we saw everything fail, people losing jobs. We saw the bankers, you know, testifying in front of Congress. There's going to be riots. I mean, are you expecting to see the same thing occur? I'd say that's the thing I fear the most. Yeah. Um, you mentioned riots. Uh, we've been, uh, I, 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 and to answer your question, I, I, again, I, it's impossible to say. You know, the the Fed went in there uh, with, you know, remember when they went in with TARP and everything right. else? I mean, everything was broken. And we have been, it's a zombie economy ever since. I mean, everything died in 2008. And they they went in and they changed the accounting rules and allowed these banks to, to rather than mark all of their accumulated bonds and all these worthless securities at pennies on the dollar, they allowed them to mark them to maturity as if they're all going to come due in now 25, 23 years and everybody's going to get their money back and everything's fine. And so they've created this illusion that everything's fine and pumped all this money and drove the stock market up and everybody's walking around like, well, you know what? That's just a distant memory. Yeah, the economy hasn't recovered, but you know, really everything's fine. It's not. I mean, it's, again, it's, it's kind of, the economy is a walking zombie. It's dead. But it's, it has this illusion of being alive. And so the next time this all comes to fruition and, and awareness, maybe they just, you know, do a, a two point some odd trillion dollar tarp and pump everything back up again. It's impossible to, to really say how it will play out. What, what I, and from a, you know, financial index and stock market index and all that kind of stuff standpoint. What I worry more about, mm -hmm. um, 
is what you, the second thing you mentioned, and I'll, and I'll play off that word riot. We have, uh, since the 60s, and then when Nixon closed the gold window, you know, there was a great quote from uh, John Connolly, who was the Secretary of the Treasury. And folks remember, he was the guy that was holding his Stetson hat in the front seat of the limo when Kennedy got shot, because he was the governor of Texas at the time. Anyway, he was a secretary of treasury in the in the 70s. And his famous quote was, you know, we have this exorbitant privilege of printing as much money as we want because we're the reserve currency. And the dollar is our currency, but it's your problem talking to everybody else. Because as we printed money uh, and, and printed dollars, most of that got exported overseas to places like China. And China, having nothing else to do with those dollars, uh, would recycle them back to the U.S. by buying treasuries and, and essentially locking them up, almost quarantining them, if you will. Same thing could be said about, you know, the, the petrodollar and the idea that they structured all uh, crude oil selling to be done in dollars back in the 70s. Why? So that there would be always a market for dollars. And then these Middle Eastern com countries would take their dollars and buy treasuries. Again, locking up all of these dollars that we've printed since the 1970s. So what I worry about the most is that as the world moves toward some other standard, which invariably is going to happen, the U it's really hard for people to imagine the U.S. not on a reserve dollar reserve currency standard because that's all we've ever known. But it's only been this way for 70 years. It hasn't been this way, you know, since the year 526. Right. Okay. It's just a transitory thing. I mean, this is having this power uh, is, 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 like I said, it's a transient thing. So when this happens, as the world transitions away from the dollar, because, again, our system is unsustainable, all this debt, all of those dollars come free that have been quarantined and all these bonds and everything else for the last 40 years. And those dollars come home. Hmm. And we may not be looking at, you know, wheelbarrows full of money, though we might. Uh, but all those dollars come home. And when you have more and more supply of an existing good, that good being the dollar, the value of it plummets. And so you look around at uh, the population of this country that's already has been uh, stressed to the extreme. I mean, I'm regular folks that are working two jobs, you know, and, and, their, and their spouse is working and they're trying to pay their taxes and put their kids through college and all this. They have no savings and they can barely afford to make ends meet. And then all of a sudden, all these dollars come home and uh, cost of gasoline goes to ten dollars a gallon. You know, just to eat, to feed your family goes through the roof. I mean, the, the the potential for social and society upheaval is significant. And so, at the end of the day, you. I mean, I don't mean to be Mister <laughs> Doom and Gloom and scare everybody, but that's you know that's the kind of thing that concerns me more than anything else. Uh, not so much how the stock market performs right. in the years ahead. It's just where this might all eventually lead. Uh, from a societal standpoint. Now, I mean, you mentioned that the Fed, you know, will probably throw a lot more or print a lot more or just push a button. <laughs> yeah. Throw a lot more money at this. Um, but isn't everyone going to lose faith? Is everyone going to say, well, okay, they're going to just throw all of this at yeah. the problem. And is this, what are we really doing here? Because right. it didn't work the last time. Why is it going to work this time? Right. That And that gets back to where, I guess, where we started, Dave. Uh, coming up on Thursday. And then again, you know, they may just try to tap dance their way through Thursday. And then that will really ramp up the pressure on whatever they're going to do in December because they are finally in a box. They have played this game now with the green shoots and uh, we're going to keep a zero interest rate policy until, you know, the early part of 2013. Then we're going to start raising rates. I mean, they played this game, bluffed their way to this point. That at some point, everything was going to be normal again. You know, the balance sheet was going to shrink. The interest rates were going to, and everything was going to be fine. And we're finally at this point where uh, it's going to be found that the emperor has no clothes. And, and, and so, okay, <laughs> this is where it gets interesting. Come as soon as Thursday. Does the Fed look at it and go, well... Uh, we're just going to have to take our chances with these global markets and all the deflation and and disinflation and the pressure it's going to put on the Chinese and the currency wars. We're going to have to take our chances with how that's going to play out. And we're going to raise rates because we've got to keep 
any uh, this air of legitimacy about us. We got to keep playing this game as long as we possibly can. And th- they might recognize they get the side benefit of seeing the stock market go up if they do raise rates. Because if they don't, it's exactly what you just said, Dave. They they will finally be revealed as being the bluffers and the liars that they've been all along, always trying to tell you, oh yeah, it's, everything's just oh yeah, everything's fine. everything's on page, everything's going to be fine. Well, if you're never going to raise interest rates, and if your only solution is to print, just keep printing and printing and printing, because really that is their only solution. Right. All of a sudden, everybody figures out, oh, I mean, even the mainstream people finally have to admit that, oh, oh yeah, okay, well, no, okay, now we see what this is really about and where this is headed. And it gets out of control for them then as well. I, I, this is a very interesting time to be alive, no doubt. And the next major act of theater comes Thursday. Well, Craig, I really appreciate you being on the X-22 Report Spotlight. You gave us a, a lot of information, and I really appreciate you being on here. Thank you very much. Hey, Dave, it's a pleasure. If uh, I just wouldn't, yeah, anytime you'd like to do it again, I'll be happy to do it. And anybody that wants to kind of continue this discussion, tfmetalsreport.com is where they, we do this on a daily basis. A bunch of folks that we all kind of are in the same boat together and we're all trying to get through it together and i encourage people to check it out yeah i'll put those all the links at the bottom of the video so everyone can find it